Good evening, and welcome as we continue with the 21st season of seminars at Steamboat. I think you know the drill from me. I'm Walt Dabbert, seminars chair, and today we're presenting the fourth of our fifth presentation on topics that range from emerging technologies to the environment and the social justice to international affairs. The seminars board strives to present seminars that are factual, informative, and timely, shedding light on key public policy issues. Your presence here is a reflection of your commitment to staying informed. The seminars board members wish to express our deep gratitude to all our sponsors and all our volunteers who make this season possible. Your donations enable us to present these seminars and these impactful presentations year after year, all at no cost of admission, and it's your donations that make that happen. We especially want to recognize today's sponsor, the Yampa Valley Community Foundation, and today's supporting sponsors, Carol and Russ Atha. And now, here to introduce this evening's speakers is Seminars Board Member Neil Best. Thank you so much. Joining, this, joining us this evening are Luke Runyon and Dr. Heather Tanana. Luke is KUNC's managing editor and reporter covering the Colorado River water basin. This has been Luke's beat since 2017. I'm going to note here that I don't believe it's a coincidence that since Luke began covering the issues of the Colorado River water basin and the subsequent extended national coverage on Morning Edition 1A, All Things Considered, Here and Now, and Weekend Edition, that the New York Times and the Washington Post, among other outlets, have begun much more extensive coverage of the same topics Luke has been reporting on since 2017. Our featured speaker this evening is Heather Tanana, visiting professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. In 2021, she was recognized by the American Bar Association for distinguished achievement in environmental law and policy for her work, including the 2021 report, Universal Access to Clean Water for Tribes in the Colorado River Basin. A proud citizen of the Navajo Nation, Heather has worked extensively on tribal water issues from climate change impacts to Colorado River management. Please give an enthusiastic Steamboat Springs welcome to Luke and Heather. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you. Um, so, like Neil said, my name is Luke Runyon, and I'm a man managing editor at KUNC, which is the public radio station for Northern Colorado. And it feels good to be in Steamboat because this is our home turf. Um, and I'm also president of the board for the Society of Environmental Journalists. Uh, and I want to give you just a little bit of a preview of the program that we're going to have this evening, since you have two people up here on stage instead of just one uh, speaker. Uh, so, I'm, when I was invited to speak here, I was instructed to give kind of a big, broad overview of Colorado River issues before passing things off to Heather to give uh, a more focused look at some tribal water issues in the basin. And 
we're going to do that. So I'm going to present on the big, broad issues, pass it over to Heather. Uh, we're going to have a conversation here on stage, and then we're going to toss it out to you for audience questions, and I'll pull those up on my phone. So if you've got questions that are coming up, make sure to put those in there so we have those for the audience Q&A. Um, and in radio, we don't often get a chance to show visuals, and so when I do live events, it's always nice to be able to bring a bunch of photos to show you the things that I'm describing on the radio. So that's what you're going to get a lot of from me tonight. Um, and I wanted to start really with uh, how we imagine the Colorado River. Uh, for most of us here in Colorado, I think if you were to say the Colorado River, this is what you would probably picture in your mind. Uh, this is a stretch of the river near Kremling. We think of these uh, kind of like winding, lazy uh, stream. You know, you might think of like a whitewater reach somewhere downstream of here. Uh, and this is another uh, overview of the Colorado River near Kremling. Uh, you might think of one of its many tributaries, like the Yampa River. This is out near Steamboat Rock in Yampa Canyon. Um, but the Colorado River is a very big and diverse place, uh, and I can't do a Colorado River talk without bringing a map of the Colorado River Basin, and so that's what this is. And I love this map because it gives you a good overview of the entire basin. Not just the actual hydrologic boundary, that's the, the black line that you see on the map, but it also shows how we've manipulated the Colorado River and its tributaries to serve our needs, whether that's for municipal use or agricultural use. Um, and that's what those big red crosshatch areas are, is areas where water from the Colorado River has been transported outside of the, the natural boundary, whether that's diversions to the Front Range or to you know, the Imperial Valley in California. And it's a big, diverse basin with a pretty big problem. And the problem is essentially that there's not enough water to meet everyone's needs. Uh, I promise this is the only graph in, the, in the, my slides. Uh, but this shows the total storage in Lakes Mead and Powell, which are the two largest reservoirs in the country. They both are on the Colorado River. Uh, Lake Mead just outside Las Vegas, Lake Powell on the Arizona-Utah border. And they've been struggling over the last 20-some years because of continued overuse of the river and diminishing supply from climate change. So if we think of the Colorado River in Colorado as this sort of tumbling mountain stream, uh, this is where the Colorado River becomes a much more controlled system. This is a Glen Canyon Dam. It holds up Lake Powell. Uh, and, you know, really, Lake Powell is, has, has struggled for the last couple of years. Just earlier this year, it hit its lowest point since it was filled in the 1960s. Uh, it's gotten a, a pretty significant boost this year with the snowpack, but it's still just about 40% of its total capacity. Uh, more often than not, this is what I think of when I hear the Colorado River. This is uh, a view of Lake Mead uh, with its iconic bathtub ring, um, kind of a, such an easy visual reminder of where water just isn't anymore and used to be. Uh, or, you know, you can think of the Imperial Dam. This is a, a this is the single largest diversion of Colorado River water. Uh, it's down on the California-Arizona border. Uh, shunts the river's water over to Southern California to grow alfalfa, bell peppers, lettuce, melons, Brussels sprouts. Uh, and that's all in kind of the, the area around the Coachella Valley and the Salton Sea area in Southern California. Or you'll think of maybe Yuma, Arizona, uh, if anybody's ever been there. Um, if you're ever eating a salad in December, it's a very good likelihood that, that those salad greens came from the Yuma, Arizona area. So this is one of those issues where even if you feel like you're not totally connected to the Colorado River, you're probably interacting with it in ways that you aren't even totally cognizant of. Um, I've found in my reporting that water issues are really driven by 
relationships, mostly our relationship to water and rivers and streams and reservoirs, and our relationship to it really drives how we feel a lot about some of these issues of water scarcity in the Southwest. Uh, so that can be, you know, a river just showing up in the background of a selfie. This is a horseshoe bend in Page, Arizona. Or it can be through a bathroom faucet in Broomfield, which is what this shows. Or it can provide water for Denver or Phoenix, or Los Angeles, or Albuquerque, or Salt Lake City. Most major cities in the Southwest uh, rely on some water from the Colorado River or its tributaries. Or it can be in Las Vegas, another major city that uses Colorado River water uh, and its vast artificial lawns that are going in. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Or farms across the seven states and Mexico. This is a melon field just outside of Yuma, Arizona. Or ranches, um, which is something that I know is very close to home here in Route County and in and around Steamboat Springs. Uh, you know, really water is something that connects us and it's not a partisan issue uh, that I've found. Uh, it's it's an issue that individual users have their relationship to water. It kind of dictates how some of these issues around water scarcity play out. And it affects, you know, the, the solutions that are coming out around water scarcity in the Southwest. The overarching thing that I want you to take away is basically... The, the problem in the Colorado River Basin is one of supply and demand. We don't have enough water to meet everyone's needs, but deciding how to go about using less and when and why is very difficult because somebody is gonna feel that pain. Somebody's gonna have to feel like they're, they're using less. And the River Basin community which both I would say Heather and I are a part of, is dealing with this gap between supply and demand. There's never been enough water in the Colorado River Basin to do everything that we want to do with it. Um, and now with climate change, that gap is widening and we really haven't quite figured out how to close it just yet. Um, and so that gap is what I wanted to focus on in my podcast, which came out er uh, earlier this year in May. Uh, it's called Thirst Gap, so I really leaned into the whole gap uh, <laughs> uh, concept. Uh, and the reporting took me all over the basin to, people, to figure out how people were grappling with water scarcity and adapting to it in real time, um, which took me to Lake Powell to meet with houseboaters. I don't know if we've got any in the crowd here tonight, but uh, it was a really fun trip. Went out with Sherry Fascinelli, who took me around the side canyons of Lake Powell to learn about houseboat culture at Lake Powell and how much she loved this reservoir that was, that was drying up. You know, boat ramp after boat ramp was closing the summer that we met up. Uh, and that's really what is so fascinating about Lake Powell is you have people who were both concerned about what's happening at Lake Powell with its decline, and then you also have people who are really giddy at the same time. They're looking at the same set of facts and coming to very different conclusions. Uh, this is in the delta of Lake Powell where the Colorado River comes in, and it's a really wild landscape because of how low the reservoir has been. Uh, we boated down this flowing reach of the Colorado River that hadn't flowed in decades because it was inundated by Lake Powell, and uh, we were essentially uh, boating through a landscape made of mud because we were boating through the, the former lake bottom of Lake Powell. I started calling this place Mudtopia because it's basically a landscape of, of mud. Uh, you know, this is, the river is flowing on a perched layer of mud and sediment that used to be the bottom of, of Lake Powell. And now that the river is flowing because the reservoir is so low, it's kind of creating its own mini canyon of mud. Uh, and Lake Powell has a huge sediment problem that I think people are only kind of coming to terms with just now. 
Uh, you can also head into the side canyons of Lake Powell and find these kind of eerie artifacts from when it was full. Um, so we're about two miles from the water at this point, <laughs> and we found a sunken speedboat, uh, sunglasses, uh, life jackets, beer cans from the 1980s, uh, and no, no bodies, that's more of a Lake Mead problem. Um, but you would, see pr you would see propeller marks on the sandstone as you were hiking, and your mind would, would like kind of do a split screen of like, oh yeah, we used to be deep underwater here, and now we're hiking in the desert. It's so strange. Um, I went there with people in charge of the Glen Canyon Institute, and uh, they are pretty blunt that they want to see Lake Powell go away. They want it to be drained. Uh, and this used to be a pretty fringe idea in the Colorado River Basin. You'd hear it every now and then, uh, especially at live events like this. Um, but it's become, you know, I think the people at the Glen Canyon Institute are making a case that the reservoir is kind of going away on its own if we're not able to make changes to our demand for water in the Southwest. So it's not as much of a harebrained idea anymore, especially with the reservoir hitting record lows. Um, what drew me to Powell to do some of this reporting was how, how people and their relationships to water were affecting their view of this problem as either something to fix or as an opportunity to kind of grasp onto and, and get people talking. I spent some time in Las Vegas neighborhoods to do the podcast. This is Devin Choltko. She's a water waste investigator for the Las Vegas Valley's main water utility. Uh, Vegas has passed, even though it has a reputation for being kind of a, a place of excess, they've uh, passed some of the most aggressive water conservation measures in the country. Um, there are certain types of uh, turf that are now illegal or going to be illegal in the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, they have 20 of these investigators going out into the field, making sure people are watering their grass in, in the right way, making sure that there's not too much flowing off their property, uh, and, and limiting all sorts of irrigation of turf. Uh, we'll, we'll hear m more about tribal water from Heather, but I wanted to just give like a quick primer so this is Charles Escalante. He's a tribal council member for the Fort Yuma Kitsan tribe, which is near Yuma, Arizona. And some tribes, I think, are becoming more active in river, the river's total political landscape. Uh, they're, you know, the, tr the tribe here, the Kitsan, uh, have been able to come up with a, a water sharing agreement with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which is the, the agency for the entire Los, uh, Los Angeles metro area. It's kind of an, an innovative approach of where both cities and tribes are being able to benefit from some of this water scarcity. So the tribe is fallowing some of its farmland and conserving that water in Lake Mead for use by some of these cities in California. My reporting also took me to the Navajo Nation uh, to meet with Crystal Tuli Cordova. She's the principal hydrologist for the Navajo Nation, works for the tribal government. Uh, she wears a lot of hats in, in doing that job. Uh, and really, you know, the focus for the Navajo tribe right now is on clean water access. And I know Heather's gonna talk some more about that. Um, and really having a strong push for having their water rights quantified. Uh, they have a large amount of water that they're entitled to from the Colorado River, but haven't had it quantified. Uh, there was just recently a Supreme Court case that was dealing with this exact question. Um, and are still you know, trying to figure out how to go about securing all of the water that they're entitled to for the tribe. And even though uh, the Colorado Plateau is beautiful and has amazing landscapes, most of the time it looks like this when I'm doing reporting. Uh, it's talking to policymakers, both at the state and federal level, who are doing a lot of the negotiating over the river's future. Uh, you know, I, one of the things that makes this moment on the river so interesting is that and the, the video before was, was so wonderful in laying out some of that history in that 
most of the history of the Colorado River was all about using more water from the Colorado River. That was the story of the Colorado River for almost 100 years, was figuring out how to use more water from the Colorado River. And very recently, within the last couple decades, a flip was switched. Switch was flipped. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now the conversation is about using less, which is like a huge paradigm shift for the Southwest as a whole and for a lot of these policymakers. Um, and so that's where a lot of my focus and reporting is going, is figuring out what, what their priorities are. Um, and then I just wanted to end with a few photos from the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. Because this to me is like the perfect visualization of what our over-reliance looks like. Um, this is kind of the ultimate collateral damage of, uh, of using too much water from the Colorado River. Because the, Mexico uses some water from the river, um, but the, about the last 100 miles of the river is dry most of the time. Um, and because of a dam that sits right on the U.S.-Mexico border, it's called the Morelos Dam, it diverts the water into Mexico for their use in the Mexicali Valley. You can see the, the wall there. But this is really what the Colorado River Delta is. That's all tidal water. You know, before we built all these dams to control the river, you would get a rush of fresh water that would be flowing into the ocean here. It would be an estuary. It's not really an estuary anymore because it's just the tidal water from the Gulf of California that comes up into the delta and there's no river to meet it anymore. You can see there, it's an area with tons of dead vegetation, you know, dead mesquite, dead tamarisk. Uh, but because of some of the efforts and agreements between the US and Mexico, some water sometimes does go into the Colorado River Delta. This was one of those moments, this was in June of last year. And you can see the river coming in from the top right portion of the photo and the tidal water coming in at the bottom portion. Uh, and basically the US and Mexico agreed that the environment was deserving of some amount of water. And so there are these water deliveries that happen uh, in, in that portion of the Colorado River Basin in the Delta. And you can see that tidal water coming in to meet the river. I think of this as like that, the fingers, what is it, the creation of Adam, where the two fingers are kind of coming to meet each other. Um, and the, the reconnection between the river and the, the tide is pretty brief, but it, you know, at least uh, last summer, it was, it was uh, at least several weeks that the, the river and the ocean were mixing. And a lot of the water that is delivered to the river channel is through Mexican, Mexico's irrigation canals, like this one in the Mexicali Valley. And uh, there's a lot of restoration work that's going on in Mexico, and a lot of that is because of this binational agreement between the U.S. and Mexico to do restoration work, to bring water back to the historic river channel uh, in Mexico. And it's really heartening, but it takes a lot of water, and you know these agreements only last for a specific amount of time, and... Uh, there's no guarantee that they'll continue forever. This is one of those restoration sites from above, and you can just see the amount of agriculture in that area is pretty staggering, not just in Mexico, but just over the border in Yuma, Arizona as well. This is one of those restoration sites. And with that, I'm going to pass things off to Heather to zoom in on uh, some of her work. And so, Heather, take it away for us. So thank you so much for having me. So as mentioned, my name's Heather Tanana. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation. On my mother's side, I'm of European descent. And on my father's side, my clans are the Towering House and the Black Streak Woods people. And it's really nice to be here in Steamboat. We actually came down from Salt Lake, which was hitting like 103, you know, kind of high temperatures. And we rolled in here and thought, this is a nice place. <laughs> it really reminded me, you know, of like this connection to place. And I imagine many of you live here because when you come home and you're able to sit out on your back porch, you're able to feel that breeze, look up at the mountains, right? 
He feels something, this connection of place. For me, when I go back to the Navajo reservation and we would do the long six hour drive, six hour plus drive from Salt Lake down to visit my parents in Monument Valley, you hit a point where you start to see the red sand and the sandstone. And that's when I felt that rush over you of, oh, I'm home. And that's where I was born, down in southern Utah, in Montezuma Creek, on the northwestern part of the Navajo Reservation in Utah. And it's this connection of place and homeland that really got me into the work that I'm doing, working uh, in the law and in public health. Because when we're talking about tribal issues specifically, and really their health and environment, it's so intrinsically connected with federal laws and history. So that's what I want to talk about uh, and highlight during my time. The history that really only has been recently acknowledged about our 30 tribal nations in the Colorado River Basin, who all, many of them, have that connection to home in the basin, from the Mojave people to the Diné, their origin stories are connected to the land. My good friend, Nora McDowell, who's Mojave, uh, you can Google her and listen to her talks on YouTube too. She will share their stories about why they are called people of the river, that they came out of the river, and when they move on to the next world, they'll return through the river. And for the Navajo, you know, we have our four sacred mountains that we passed through three worlds became, before we uh, merged out of this current world, which is the glittering world. And so place matters. And the Colorado River Basin, not just the river, but the broader environment, has been very important to tribal nations across the seven states who were here, you know, long before uh, this country was established. And yet, notwithstanding that, they've faced severe water and security challenges for decades. Dig Deep and U.S. Water Alliance did a really great report that actually came out during the pandemic, talking about how 2.2 million Americans today don't have potable water access in their homes. And you might think, well, we've got over 330 million people in the US. So it's a pretty small percentage, right? Aren't we doing good enough? Well, if you look at who are those families that don't have running water, it's not based on the rural nature of where they live. It's not based on their social economic status. It is based on their race. And in the United States today, Latino and black families are twice as likely as white households to lack piped water into their homes. When we go to Native Americans, it's 19 times more likely to not have water access. And for the Navajo Nation, it's 67 times. That is unacceptable. And that's part of the reason why I'm really thrilled to be a part and to have led the Universal Access to Clean Water Initiative that was launched by the Water and Tribes Initiative also at the start of the pandemic. And the purpose of our work at the beginning was to really understand what do we mean by lack of water access? Is that the same for all the tribes in the basin? And what can we do about it? How can we close that water gap? I love that word. Okay, and certainly I'll say when I was going into the work, I thought, oh, it's a piped water problem, right? And which makes sense. I came from Navajo. If you're Navajo, someone in your family is hauling water, right? And yes, that certainly is a challenge. Um, many tribes beyond Navajo Nation, like Hopi, which is located within the Navajo Nation, also face uh, water challenges of not having that infrastructure in the first place in the home. Uh, other communities like White Mountain Apache, uh, Southern Utes, also here in Colorado, there are water haulers in the Southern Ute tribal community. So what did they have to do and what do I mean by water hauling? It's a very arduous task. 
And I think we got more attention on this during the pandemic because uh, national attention was highlighting the high COVID rates among Navajo families. This is actually um, a database that the Indian Health Services manages. So the IHS is a federal agency that was established based on treaty and trust responsibilities that the government has, and their mission is to elevate the health of Native people to the highest status. Well, not surprisingly, given this connection between water and sanitation and health, they started a sanitation facilities construction program in the late 50s, 1959, in order to bring in piped water into Native American homes. So they maintain a database. Like all data, it's not perfect, right? There is no one who is going out and surveying home to home. Instead, they rely a lot on the tribe to notify them of deficiencies. And so they keep this database. And what this one, this map here shows are the number of homes on Navajo Nation that don't have any water or sanitation services. And you can see right there, right, on the north uh, western corner of Navajo, a lot of homes are lacking water. So these families often go varying distances. For some, maybe it's just a 10 minute drive down the street. And there might be a little faucet, a community access point. They can fill up these five gallon barrels or bigger in their trucks. But for others, they're having to drive hours to a little well throwing a bucket down that well, hauling it up, dumping that bucket into their retainer and repeating that until their whatever five gallon, it's tended to be a five gallon barrel is filled, loading it up in their car, making the drive back home. So these families, particularly the ones that have to go further distances, are often rationing two to three gallons of water use a day. And Again, different statistics out there, but the average American household or American is using 88 to 100 gallons a day. And it's estimated that if you take a shower, you know, a 10 minute shower, you're using about 15 gallons. So just think of what you have to do if you're trying to even use 10 gallons or two to three and all of the water needs you have. It's domestic, cleaning, cooking, eating, bathing, but there's no distinction on those water uses on Navajo. They're also having to use that water if they have a pet or livestock to make sure that they get the water that's necessary as well. And uh, the estimates of the cost of water hauling as opposed to having piped water is that hauling is 71 times more expensive. If we're looking at an acre per feet calculation, it's about $600 per acre feet for piped water, $43,000 for water haulers. When we, uh, as part of an amicus brief for the Arizona versus Navajo Nation case, and we interviewed different families to put in that personal element of what their experience is like. And there was a, a gentleman, Boyd Silversmith, who lived down in that red area there on the border of Arizona and Utah. And he talked about how he was a PE teacher at the local high school. And he used to open up the school early so that the kids that were water haulers could come in and utilize the school facilities to take showers, right? Changes the way you live your life. But let's say you even have piped water coming in to your community. You're one of the lucky ones, you got a faucet. But what good is it if you can't drink it, right? So water quality is a large pervasive challenge as well for the tribes that even if they've gotten you know, the pipes, that infrastructure in place, the community can't utilize the water because it's unsafe. And Hopi is really our classic example of that challenge. Their water system, the first water big system was put in place by uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs actually. So the government went in and did this in the 60s. Well, they tapped into an aquifer that had naturally occurring arsenic. So 75% of people residing on Hopi are drinking water or utilizing water that has unsafe levels of arsenic. 
And it was the government that did that. And then, of course, the tribe was getting fined by EPA for not meeting the water quality standards, right? Like, this is a problem. And fortunately for Hopi, actually under our Trump administration, they uh, directed some funds. It's called the HAMP Hopi uh, Arsenic Mitigation Project. That's finally, here we are, what, 40, 50, 60 years later, uh, should finally start addressing that arsenic contamination in that one system. But even if you don't have a naturally kind of a really harmful contaminant like arsenic, this is the water that came out of a chapter house on Navajo. So during the pandemic, uh, a working group was put together to try and increase the access points for some families. And they put in quite a few d additional water source points and it cut down the average travel time by 38 minutes, decreased it to get water. And this was one in the Yambido chapter house the water came out brown and smelling and it tasted weird and the, not surprisingly, the community didn't want to utilize it. Well, they did some testing and it turns out that's iron. It's high iron levels and EPA uh, said, well, technically it meets the standard so we're not gonna do anything about it. Right? What do you have to do? I mean, and, and unfortunately, this were, ended up working out because reclamation, kind of out of the, I don't know who they contacted. Someone must have had a connection. Reclamation happened to have some filters or funding they could use for filters, and it addressed the, the high iron levels. But communities shouldn't be relying on the goodwill of some federal agency to address their challenges, right? So there are other things we found in that report that was first mentioned um, that we did in 2021 beyond piped initially infrastructure coming in, addressing water quality challenges. There are some communities where their infrastructure is fine for now, but they're growing, right? Native Americans are one of the fastest growing populations according to our recent census numbers. And we have an amazing youth movement right now where they're reclaiming their indigenous identity and they want to live on their homelands. They want to grow up learning from their elders. And it's hard to do that if the infrastructure in place, even if it's meeting current standards, isn't sufficient to support a growing population. And so we need to maintain those systems as well. And this whole O&M component we could talk about for a long time. I do not have an engineering background, but we learned a lot talking with engineers. And a big concern was putting in these systems. They could be state-of-the-art, very climate-resilient but who's going to operate and maintain them? And that's a kind of a bigger challenge when we talk about capacity. So, you know, what's fascinating is that access to clean drinking water in the United States, it's not a contested issue. There have been polls and broad bipartisan support. Every American in the United States should have clean drinking water. This is America. We have done great things, right? I gotta say, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I love living in the United States, not just because it's home, my homelands, but I had two uncles that volunteered to serve in World War II as Navajo code talkers, and they have both passed on. But when we would ask my uncle Albert, you know, not all the states were even letting you vote at the time. Why in the world did you volunteer? He lied about his age to serve in the military. And his response was, it's to protect Mother Earth. This is our land. It's to protect our homelands. And so I think, you know, we're this, I actually do have a lot of pride in, in our country and what we can achieve. And there's support for solving this gap. And a lot of it is supported by scientific studies. We don't doubt that clean water is needed for individual health, that there's even connections with, you know, our supporting our broader, really supporting indigenous viewpoints of holistic balance in community, that when our surroundings and our environment is healthy, we are healthy, right? So there are research out there 
about the health connection, about the mental health well-being. There's economic studies out there as well. Dig Deep followed up with a second report about the economic benefits that this uh, lack of water access to those two million Americans was costing our economy $152 million annually. And if we were to close that gap, we would have great economic benefits, right? So if we can all get on board with this, why do we have this problem still here in 2023? Well, that's where I want to shift over and talk a little bit about the past, right? I am a firm believer that we cannot talk and address any present day issues unless we spend some time talking about the past and how we got here. Why, well, this is my family. So on the left here, well, yeah, your left. Uh, that's my dad and the little, you know, squatting there with the hat and one of his siblings. Those are my aunt and uncles. And then on the color photos, that's my nephew and my aunt with one of my nieces, right? So my dad grew up very traditionally. He didn't have water access. Why is it that um, one of my cousins today, here we are, what is that? So my dad's born in the 50s, 70 years later, still doesn't have water access? Well, I'm going to argue it absolutely is related to the history and federal Indian policies. And as a little start, I always love to, you know, normally I have a longer quiz, but I kept it short here. I like to leave time for Q&A. But how does the Declaration of Independence refer to Native Americans? Multiple choice, so it's not too scary. You know, I said, A, native inhabitants, B, indigenous people, C, I heard some Cs yelling out, merciless Indian savages, or no reference at all, right? People are like, it's, it's C. <laughs> merciless Indian savages, oh man, right? So this important, like, foundational document in our history, this is how we're referring to Native Americans, right? So not getting off on the best foot there. And we didn't continue to kind of, right, because of these policies that that followed. And so if you were to ever take a federal Indian law, you will see this time frame in that class because they've divided up the federal policies into these different eras. And a foundational principle in federal Indian law is that it's all based on the doctrine of discovery. And you may have heard, um, you know, the Catholic Church repudiated this doctrine. This is really the basis. It was an international principle of law that justified uh, the exploration and taking of, of lands um, when, you know, the explorers went out. And it serves as the basis here in our law as well, justifying the colonization in the United States. First, you know, by other countries, England, and then subsequently by the United States when we took over title from the king. And there hasn't been, unlike Canada's kind of a, the lead in indigenous efforts, I'd say, um, but we haven't done anything in this country to repudiate that doctrine. And it, and there's no way to beat around the bush. It has some very racist, like, origins <laughs> to it that Native Americans were merciless Indian savages, that they were incapable, just these warriors, and war was all that they were good at. And if they were to really succeed as a people, we had to Christianize them, and we had to uh, turn them into farmers, right? Cultivate the land. And that is still the root and underlying basis of our law and created this tension with the status of Native Americans, that they are sovereign entities. They can pass their own laws. They can have their own tribal courts governing their people and their lands, but they're domestic dependent nations as well, reliant on the federal government for protection. And so it's created some tensions here between tribes trying to act as their sovereigns, protecting their communities, but by necessity having to rely on the federal government at the same time to uphold promises that were made, because tribes don't own their land fully. They don't own their water rights 
fully. They don't have all of the same control that other sovereigns would. And then moving on, you know, I'll say the big takeaway is that really until we got to our current era of the self-determination, it was about removing tribes westward to open up land for white settlers at different points to assimilate them into mainstream society. And, and we could only do that if they were to um, reject their indigenous identity and way of life. And at one point, we had many tribes who were just their even status as sovereign nations were just straight up terminated. So throughout this whole time period, you know, a lot of actions taken that really resulted in significant historical trauma that remains today. And if you want to read more about that, Maria, um, Bra I'm going to mix up her name, Maria Yellow Braveheart uh, has done a lot of work in this area with respect to tribal communities. And these events that happened, they may seem like a very, very long time ago, right? The long walk and removal from land. But the Navajo, we're pretty fortunate to still return to our homeland. It was reduced, but it's still our original homelands. When we talk a lot about the Eastern tribes, that wasn't the case for them. All those tribes that ended up in Oklahoma lost that connection to their places of origin. And then, you know, the boarding schools, that removal again of children from their families. And even if you were to look at the education of Native children, I think, you know, something, again, we could all get behind, isn't it good to educate Native children? Let's assume that was actually the purpose. Uh, the way that we went about it, the way that the federal government removed children and educated them, again, long-lasting harm that communities are still recovering from. My own father was a boarding school uh, kid. He was removed from his family. Right? They didn't ask the families, they just took the kids, and often hours away, and the treatment that many of these kids had was so, I mean, on one end, just abusive, right? Many children died in boarding schools and never made it back to their home. And then on the other time, just, you know, very emotionally draining. So at my dad's boarding school, he said, yeah, their hair was cut. They were punished for speaking Navajo, right? They were physically hit sometimes. And it was such that he ran away one night and it was a cold night and he says he would have died if a farmer rancher hadn't come along and found him and returned him to the school. And I thought, what makes a young kid run away? Not you know, even knowing really how to get back must have been something pretty traumatic. And I think of my own kids, right? Of that, you're them first being taken away from you and then trying to get back to you. There is a better way to educate Native kids. And so that's, I like to share that because there's a lot of good goals out there that I'd agree with, right? We're seeing it now with the push for renewable energy. But renewable energy, right? Our batteries still require lithium. And lithium is an extractive industry as well. And so some tribal communities are facing this again of all the burdens and the environmental degradation that might go to benefit some other community are falling on them. So how can we engage tribal communities when we might have a goal and a purpose that we can all get behind in a way that they're leading the roles that these negative harms are not just falling on them? So again, a lot of other actions that took place. Uh, many don't know that Native women were sterilized by Indian Health Service physicians without their knowledge or consent. Uh, the whole energy development of uranium, right? We have tr babies, Navajo babies being born with traces of uranium still in their blood today. So all of these challenges 
This is what our communities are still dealing with, and it really ties a lot into capacity issues. So I, again, I love Q&A, so I want to tie this back to Colorado River and then, and then get into our discussion. So as mentioned, 30 tribes across the Colorado River Basin, wonderful documentary that talked about how tribes were not involved at all in the management discussions. In that 1922 compact, not a single tribal interest was represented. And indeed, right, the Wild Indian Clause, this is, won't impact tribal rights. But how could you ignore that? Because of that 1908 Winters case, recognizing that tribes have water rights sufficient to meet the purpose of their reservation, which includes being a permanent homeland, uh, tribes right now, the recognized quantified rights are 25% of the average Colorado River flows. And it's estimated that once the outstanding quantified, outstanding rights are quantified, that's going to bump that up to at least 30, right? So they're significant stakeholders. And yet they weren't involved in the compact at all in these kind of shortages discussions and the guidelines, right? We're coming up on the expiration of the guidelines everyone's talking about weren't involved in that either. And if you look at the, I have the cases up there, Arizona, the, you know, Arizona versus California, Gila River, those were the two big cases that actually talked about how we would even quantify tribal water rights. So big, long time frame between 1908, tribes have tribal water rights, and then getting to how we'll actually quantify them, right? Decades, decades later. And then we can talk about Arizona, the Navajo Nation if they're in kind of our discussion, but you know, really it's Navajo Nation was trying to address that water insecurity challenge and the promise of the federal government that they would have a permanent homeland, which no one disputes requires water. And yet that case in the end, our Supreme Court in a five to four decision said that the government doesn't have to help the nation in trying to meet the water needs of its community. So I guess, you know, I don't want to end on a downer because I'm actually not really, it's easy to get depressed and kind of feel like, wah, wah. But, you know, I'm optimistic because as Luke kind of hinted at, times have changed in the last five years. Uh, the tribal role in one just the recognition, there are 30 tribal nations in the basin. Many of them, not all of them, have significant interest in the governance of the Colorado River and that those that do and want to should be involved in these discussions. That has changed dramatically in the last, I'd say, five years. And so everyone now across the seven states federal and state representatives publicly acknowledge and say tribes should be at the table. Will we, what does that mean? <laughs> That's a little bit of a, a debate, but it brings me hope that we in another 40, you know, when I'm an old, old grandparent like my dad, that my relatives and my family on the reservation, maybe they will have piped water. Right? I think it's the first light at the end of a tunnel for many of us that it's been a hard journey, but I think we'll get there. So thank you, Ayehe. Hey. That was great. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing all of that. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions because we're, we're starting to get short on time and I want to make sure that we get to audience questions too. Um, one thing that I would love to hear your thoughts on is, you know, I kind of pose this big macro problem in the Colorado River Basin as supply and demand. There's not enough water, the river's over allocated. But in your talk, it sounds like some tribes are going to end up maybe using more water from the Colorado River or its tributaries in order to close this clean water access gap. How do you make sense of that? If there's this like big, broad problem of we all need to use less, 
but then there's kind of a caveat of like, but tribes actually probably need to use more. How do you make sense of that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, when we're talking about drinking water, it's such a small percentage of the usage. And my good friend and colleague, Ann Castle, who works on the universal access with us, who's the Upper Colorado River Commissioner right now, you know, we've talked about this, that we can get drinking water out to homes and it's not going to mess with the balance of the overall flow. So I'll say as a, as a human right, we should be pushing for this for the U.S. to recognize it, the U.N. has, several countries, California and a couple other states have recognized this human right to water. We can get every American water. But there's, I think what your question also goes to and what's important to me is that tribes in the past have been handicapped, you know, because of that history I went through, right? If you're taking, you know, the number of professionals in tribal communities were like the smallest. Attorneys, 1%. Physicians, 1%, right? So there's a lot of reliance on outside How They haven't had to fully develop their economies and their interest in agriculture. I mean, that's what they were told to do for years. Anyway, so I guess this is a very long way of me saying is, yes, tribal interests that are unquantified, when we quantify them, they're going to come from a, a user that's already there. But this is an equity issue. This is a justice issue that tribal water rights have been used by other users without any compensation to tribes for decades. We compensate people all the time for their water. We engage in trade and business. Let's just allow tribes to do the same. And some are, right? Like we saw that with the Colorado River Indian tribes with leasing water. There's some ch broader challenges in there because tribes have to basically get congressional um, authority, right? A law has to be passed for them to engage in leasing and marketing and certain things like that. But that to me is if, let's just let them be like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how you, you know, I have people who ask, you know, like, what do, tri what do tribes want in the Colorado River Basin? And I'm kind of like, well, there's 30 tribes and it gets very complicated very quickly. How do you like succinctly sort of like talk about some of these issues because it does get so complex and so complicated so quickly? Yeah, yeah, I, and I think it's really this notion that tribes want to have the ability to make decisions on behalf of their people and their community. And that's been hard to do in the past. Um, and like I said, you know, some tribes have significant water interests in the Colorado River. Some don't, right? Like you might be confused, if you're confused at all by the 30 tribal nations and, you know, saying, well, I saw a reclamation map with 29. Well, that's because the San Juan Southern Paiute, they don't have their own reservation, right? And water is tied to land and reservations, right? So San Juan Southern Paiute, they're not going to care as much about these discussions of the Colorado River management because they don't have their own reservation, right? And that's what you'll hear these tribal leaders saying. Some, it's a very critical, important issues. Others, not so much, but they want that opportunity to make the decision for themselves of whether or not they're going to engage or not. And in the past, the decision was made for them. We're going to decide how to allocate. We're going to decide the management, the shortages, and tribes didn't even have a chance to engage. On, on that engagement, I mean, the governance of the whole river is so complex. You have the federal government, you have all of the state actors, then you have the, the tribes as well. Within states, you kind of have your own fault lines and tension points around water. How do you go, you know, it's, it's a nice goal to say like, we wanna include tribes more in this process. What does that actually look like? Um, and just for a little bit of background, Heather and I were at uh, a CU Boulder Colorado River Symposium recently, and there was a panel with as many tribal representatives as possible. And it was kind of like an instructive moment of like, Tribes really want to be a part, most tribes really want to be a part of this process, but how do you do it in a way that doesn't like bog down the whole system or, yeah, how do you do that? 
Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying to remember, I think there were like 14 or so different tribal representatives there, and that's probably about, you know, each of the representatives who were there were people who do care about the issues and are engaged. Um, so I'll say, again, I think the tribe needs to decide for themselves the degree they want to be involved. There's been a lot of discussion about what does a seat at the table mean, and I think everyone's trying to figure that out right now. But this idea of notion, you know, notice, notice is important. And um, there's a lot of really good work going on in the upper basin with this upper basin state tribal dialogue that's happening where the states and the tribes and the federal government are having regular meetings and engaging, because I think that's really all what it's about is relationship building, which is why I spend a lot of time on history, because if you understand where someone's coming from, you're more likely to be able to connect with them. I'm talking about like, this is this basic human level, right? And when we build relationships, that's when we can make meaningful progress. And you can be a little, I think right now, and up to, the present, people have been so defensive of their positions, but as we're starting to build more relationships, I think that process will work itself out. Like a tribe might have more confidence in saying, I don't need to be at the meeting because I trust that you will send me the you know, meeting minutes. I trust that you will reach out to me if something implicating our issues come up. We're getting there. Great. Well, we're going to move to audience questions, and I've got it on my phone up here, so I'm just going to uh, read off of there. Um, so we've got a few questions about agriculture, so I might try and succinctly put some of them together. Um, and this is a good one, and you know, I'll pose them to Heather, but maybe Heather and I can both address some of these questions. Why are we not prioritizing water usage based on necessity, farming, fishing, or industry over leisure uses, like lawns, golf courses, water sports, kind of divvying up what's the best use of the scarce water that we have? I know, well, I'd love to hear you. You know, the challenge with water law is we, it's based on this like old archaic system, right? Um, we have our prior appropriation doctrine in the West, uh, and then you have the different state laws that are gonna apply and decide what a beneficial use is. And so when you're talking about trying to change that system, especially when it, it makes a lot of money for a lot of people, I think that's just a hard thing for us to do in the US. Right, um, I've, we've had people, I think, say, before I had a conversation with Amy Haas, she's our executive director of the Colorado River Authority of Utah, you know, being like, why can't we just be like Israel, right? They have just as little water, and she's like, they nationalized water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that here? Like, we just went steps backwards in like women's rights. Like, it's not gonna happen in the US. So. I think sometimes, like, it's not to say, I, I do think we need to push, and when we throw out what other people would say are crazy ideas, it makes us think of, like, okay, think creatively, because what we've been doing is not working, I think. But I don't know, I'd love to, what do you think, Luke? Yeah, I, this is why I brought up this idea of, like, our relationship to water dictating so much of what value we put on it for what it does for us. Um, I always hear it when it comes to like water waste. Like what is wasted water? Well, oftentimes it's just like somebody using water in a way that you don't like or don't value. Um, <laughs> you know, people who point to a field of alfalfa and that, you know, maybe they're not feeding a horse. They're like, well, that looks like it's wasted water. Well, not to the person who's growing it and selling it. Um, same with taking a long shower or something like that. You know, it's really, there's no def defined uh, term for water waste that we all agree on. It's just sort of, sort of like how you feel about these things. Um, and sometimes they show up in law, but a lot of these are kind of like broader cultural attitudes that we have around water and use. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I'm, that's I think where the hope piece comes in because we have this different attitude by our youth, right? I see it with my own daughter. And I think as we see 
no offense to the older white males, but as they retire out of these positions that have been held on these water boards and the, how we've managed water, I think the influx of youth and different ideas will also maybe push some of what we think is a beneficial use. What should we prioritize? And you know, I hate to be like, you'll solve it, daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even here in Colorado, the list of what is considered a beneficial use has changed over time. You know, it used to be a very narrow uh, list of uses, and now it's pretty long. You know, there's quite a few uses that you can. So it's just a matter of the changing times. Um, this is another ag question. Uh, should farmers only be growing water-friendly crops versus water-intensive crops in the West since they consume the majority of the water from the Colorado? You want to take that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'd be like, yes. But, <laughs> you know, again, this is like economic development. I've, we've been, I, you know, in our work, I think we've talked with a lot of farmers and ag users, and I, I was actually at a conference with on a panel with a farmer who was, had tested out switching to a more water resilient crop. But then he's like, I'm gonna do what makes me money. That's his bottom line and what he cares about. Mm. And I mean, and that's the way we've set up our water system, right? As it's part of this economic business complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So I, again, you know, I, I also think it's, um, our consumer behaviors will have an impact, right? So a lot of this alfalfa is going abroad, you know, supporting meat production. And so when we change our behaviors on, you know, relying less on these heavy water dependent things, that can have an impact. I think showing up, your, using your voice, engagement in the civic process had an impact so again. Slow, yeah, I mean, so much of it is market driven, and there's a big market for alfalfa hay, which is it's like not an accident why so much of it is grown in the southwest is because there's a huge market for alfalfa hay, um, and it just so happens that it uses a lot of water. There's also too, and we talked a little bit about this, but in a lot of the way that the West water system is set up, there's an incentive to use the water that you're entitled to, um, and so there's not a ton of incentive for farmers to conserve uh, unless they're being paid uh, to do that. Um, and that's just, that's sort of like a feature, not a quirk of the Western water law is that you're incentivized to use all that you're entitled to um, under your water right. Yeah, yeah, and, and just kind of thinking of like, you know, this um, agreement, right, if you're following like what, the government was, you know, government told the states come to agreement with the shortages, and it was kind of like a game of chicken, who's going to do what? And then, right, last minute, recently, the states came to an agreement. A lot of, I think there are a lot of people who believe, though, one of the main reasons an agreement was reached was because of the federal incentives that are going in to paying for that non-water use. And so we're compensating it right now, and so I think that's something people are thinking of. You know, we can't assume that money will be there. We have to have some kind of change. And, and again, I think the relationship building and building that trust um, can help us have more candid discussions, because people do not want to be candid in the basin. <laughs> right? You want to protect, it's like protecting their interests. And, that's my job, is to make them candid as much as I can. Um, we had a question about the snowfall this year in the Colorado River Basin. And I was just talking to somebody earlier. I live in Grand Junction, so the winter wasn't too bad. But it sounds like in Steamboat Springs, it was kind of a long haul for, uh, for you all up here, um, for all you skiers. I'm sure it was a good one. The record or the healthy snowpack that Colorado and many of the upper basin states had, it was positive in that, um, you know, a lot of the smaller reservoirs in the upper basin, like Blue Mesa, like Flaming Gorge, Navajo Reservoir, um, saw good recovery. But these issues in the Colorado River Basin have taken shape over many decades. Um, and you can see these 
uh, if you like look at a graph of the amount of precipitation or the amount of reservoir storage in the Colorado River Basin, uh, you know, these kind of rises and falls take place over multiple years. And really what the Colorado River Basin would need is probably like five or six of these winters in a row, not necessarily scattered throughout uh, time. You need like sustained changes in our weather and climate in order for that to happen. And the temperature change that's happening in the Colorado River Basin is just sapping the supply. Um, you know, the Colorado River is taking a huge hit because of those rising temperatures, whether that's in the form of losing snowpack, changes in precipitation from snow to rain, uh, you know, diminished soil moisture. Really, there hasn't been much change in precipitation in the Colorado River Basin, what we're, in the amount. What we're seeing is that the rising temperatures are just messing up the water cycle in such a way that our infrastructure and the systems that we've built can't use it in the way that we used to. Um, so it was good, yeah. but <laughs> maybe like let's have four more of those and then we can talk. Yeah. Um, that's maybe how I would put yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, like Navajo in particular and other tribes, a lot of them are, rely a lot on groundwater. And so, you know, we've had chats with, I love Crystal, who is, Luke shared a photo of, you know, their big concern is like recharging those groundwater aquifers and like, help, but like, it's, it did not solve the problem. And is again, climate change is also expected to make that a harder issue. We had a question too about kind of the politics in all of this. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but, um, is there political will in DC and within the states to take these kind of broader conservation issues on? Like, do you see that there's the political will to really address some of these problems? Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's interesting because in other areas, so the interior took a, you know, they opposed the Navajo Nation in the Arizona versus Navajo Nation case, which was disappointing to see. And so my, my take on the federal government is if they can do something voluntarily, they'll like to do it. But they don't want to have a permanent obligation. And especially when we get to tribes, if they do it for one tribe, we're talking 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. So that can put a big price tag on, you know, and their obligations and duties that they have to do. And so that's why I felt like they went the way they did on Arizona versus Navajo Nation. Whereas if anyone was following the week prior, came out the, um, the decision in Brackeen versus. Holland supporting the Indian Child Welfare Act that was upheld and the interior, funny enough, it like all falls under the interior, they were in support of the tribal position in the law then. But there's no like duty on the federal government. So I've seen really great work when we're talking about tribal co-management lands and conservation pilot programs, but nothing I think that puts a permanent obligation on that going forward. So if we can see some progress on these like pilot initiatives that are happening right now, I think that would be great. Another, we've also seen um, philanthropic groups really stepping up and taking a lead in partnerships on these conservation efforts and helping to build tribal capacity to engage in that. Like for example, helping them bring on uh, personnel that's needed on, you know, like a water manager or a hydrologist so that they can run these programs themselves. So yeah, some things from the government, we'll see if they continue, right? It's, it depends on our administration, but in the meantime, these nonprofits are really helping in the philanthropic organizations. Great. Well, I think we've only got time for one more question, so we'll end on this. Um, it's a question, of, you were talking about youth leaders that you're paying attention to. You said that they're on the rise. What are they saying? How are they framing the challenges and solutions here? Um, and how is their inclusion potentially shifting the dialogue? Yeah, it's really, really exciting. Um, the whole movement with, I think, social media, right? There's like, it's amazing now. Um, 
the youth getting these accounts. I, I think of like the Western Water Girl on um, she on TikTok and Instagram, right? We have like those same kind of folks in our indigenous communities who are sharing tradition and what their uh, community and values mean to them. And we're seeing programs too, like National Wildlife Federation has one, and, and there's even some uh, reclamation started this youth program as well to educate them and get them familiar with climate change issues and how they can have an impact. So a lot of programs, and what I particularly like about our youth is they're navigating both worlds of tradition and culture, but living you know, in 21st century and modern society. They have their cell phones, right? Their Instagram accounts, but they're wearing traditional wear like almost every day. And being able to move back and forth um, and incorporating, like I mentioned, the, you know, Hojo, this concept of uh, in Navajo of balance, that when you get out of balance, bad things happen. And so that way of thinking about, you know, in your relationships, not with just people, but also, again, your environment and surroundings, we have to maintain balance. So you'll hear little concepts like that of like little traditional beliefs that they're just incorporating into everyday conversation. I think that's exciting. Also do a little plug. I did a piece with the Colorado um, Environmental Law Review that came out in their most recent issue about the rise of indigenous women in the basin, about how you know, so many of our tribal communities are matriarchal societies, and yet the female role and traditional kind of leadership role they had was displaced. And now we have women like Crystal as a principal hydrologist in her community, Lorelei Cloud, who's the vice chairwoman of Southern U, Nora McDowell, who's the cultural, you know, like, elder and wisdom keeper of her community, and Bida Becker, who's been a attorney working in water issues for Navajo forever. So these leaders are in formal positions and informal, and they are pervasive now throughout the basin. Again, changing the way we look at management, changing the values that we should protect. So that's exciting too. Well, that's a hopeful note to end on. Um, I just want to give a big thank you to Heather for being here. <laughs> And thanks to all of you for being here. It was so nice to spend time with you. Thanks. Thanks.